Hello, everybody, and welcome to this month's State of .NET webinar, The State of Azure. This month, Marcus is going to focus exclusively on the latest developments in Azure in order to arm you with the information you need to make smart technology choices about using Microsoft Azure. My name is Jim Duffy, and I'm responsible for the sales and marketing efforts for all of our code services. Code is so much more than a magazine. Code Magazine is our flagship, of course, but our other divisions include Code Consulting, where we do custom software development work, Code Training and Mentoring, and Code Staffing. If you're interested in reaching out about any of our code services, my email is on this slide. Just a quick shout out about the Fotino project. Fotino is an open source project that allows developers to create native cross-platform applications using web development technologies. You can leverage your HTML, CSS, and JavaScript skills to create apps that run on Windows, Linux, and the Mac. It, it's like Electron, but only smaller and much more lightweight. Learn more at tryfotino.io. If you don't currently subscribe to Code Magazine, we can take care of that. Code Magazine is the leading software development magazine written by expert developers for developers. As a benefit for attending, all registered attendees will automatically receive a free Code Magazine subscription, provided you don't already subscribe. I've also included a free subscription link here for you to freely share with others who couldn't make it to the webinar. Our presenter today is Marcus Egger. Marcus is the big kahuna around here. He's code president and chief software architect publisher of Code Magazine, international author and speaker, Microsoft Regional Director, and all-around nice guy. He'll be ready to start in just a moment. Our continuing mission is to help people build better software. We're a Microsoft partner, and we build custom software solutions, modernize legacy applications, and support and maintain existing applications. Our team of expert developers and consultants, and consultants are ready to help you with your next project. Our very popular and in-demand free hour of code provides an opportunity for you and or your team to meet with our hand-picked experts to discuss anything you could use our help with. Schedule your call today and let us help. No charge, no strings, no commitment, just free help from our code experts. Slots are limited, so reach out to me about getting a free hour of code scheduled for you and your team. If you like what you've seen here today or have seen in our prior webinars, please subscribe to our YouTube channel follow us on Twitter, and like us on Facebook. We would like your feedback about this webinar in the form of a quick survey, and we're willing to pay 100 bucks to one lucky winner. Their survey is very short, and you'll finish it in no time flat. We'll post the survey link in the chat window as well. It's almost time to turn things over to Marcus, but before I do, I want to share that all the slides and a recording of today's webinar, and all of our past webinars, will be available on the stateof.net page on the code website. I've included that link here. If this is your first time attending one of our webinars, welcome, and thank you so much for joining us. If you've attended a webinar in the past, welcome back. In addition to Marcus answering questions live, we have expert members of our code consulting team in the chat window to answer any questions. Okay, enough from me. Thanks for listening. Take it away, Marcus. Thank you, Jim. Well, hello and welcome, everyone. Uh, it's kind of an amazing event to be here today. Uh, tomorrow to the day, it will be one year that we have moved the Stata.net events online. So uh, kind of an odd milestone to hit here, I suppose, as we're all probably still stuck at home. Some of us uh, maybe getting a little more mobile. Uh, personally, I've actually just traveled uh, from the US to Europe. I'm coming to you from quarantine, I suppose, uh, where I'm doing a mandatory quarantine here uh, that's locally mandated, despite me being vaccinated. I'm complying with those rules. But the world sure has changed. Uh, travel isn't what it used to be. I, I certainly didn't travel because it's so much fun. Travel because I had to. And, uh, and it's been an interesting year. Uh, in that year, a lot of us has le have learned to uh, work completely different ways. And the cloud has played a very big role in that. Uh, the year has been tough, uh, there's no question, uh, a lot more negative than positive, but there have been positive aspects too. And I think the cloud has definitely been one of those. Uh, without the cloud, I think this time would have been much harder. Uh, working would have certainly been a lot harder. If this would have been just 10 or 20 years ago, I think a lot of the stuff that we are doing and how we have been able to keep going uh, just wouldn't have happened. And, and uh, again, the cloud's a big part of that. And so we are returning to this topic today. Uh, we are returning to Azure. Uh, let's take a look 
at the agenda that we have today. Uh, we are returning to Azure, which is a very broad topic. In the last few stata.nets, we focused on, on much more pointed, uh, specific or niche topics, if you will. But with this state of Azure talk, we're returning to a broader topic. Um, and that's kind of a general theme that we have for the upcoming stata.net. So we'll talk about next month's event where we'll take a look at .NET itself again. So much, much more um, uh, broad topics that we have here. Uh, somebody says the audio is not loud enough. Let me turn that up a little bit more. Hopefully that will help. Uh, so uh, what are we going to talk about? Well, we're going to talk about the Microsoft Cloud, specifically about Azure. Uh, that's something we've talked about before. In fact, you can go back, look at some of the older recordings. Um, but there's a lot of new stuff to talk about. We want to take a look at where we are with Azure, what's new. Azure has become a lot more mature, so it's not churning quite as much as it used to be. So we're not throwing things overboard as much, replacing them with new things, but we are certainly adding to the things that are there. And that's what I want to take a look at today. I also want to take a look at some general trends that we see in cloud computing. Uh, some of those trends have been brought on uh, by the COVID crisis. Some of those trends we've already seen before, but they were maybe accelerated. Uh, so that's an interesting aspect. I also want to take a look at the overall infrastructure, what's happening with Azure specifically, and what are we actually looking at? I think uh, kind of a peek behind the curtain there is always very interesting and something that while it's not maybe immediately important to us in terms of the way we do things doesn't change because of the infrastructure that sits behind. But I think it's, it's extremely important to know that that's there and how it's all working and how impressive all of that is. So we'll take a look at that. And then we'll start taking a look at some of the specific services that are available in Azure. Now, Azure is humongous. There's no way I can even give you a, a, a skin deep overview of all the services there are. So I had to pick out some services. Uh, I previously did uh, five or seven things every developer should know about Azure. Uh, so we're gonna go kind of back to that, but it's a little broader. I'm gonna show you a, a few additional services there. And some of them probably things that you haven't been aware of. Some of them maybe not even super critical to everyone. I'm trying to strike a good mix between uh, the fundamental things that everybody should know and then also showing some things that are there that people may not have been aware of that I think are very cool. So that's what we're going to do. We're going to have a little bit of code samples, but not too many. It's just too broad a topic to do a lot of that. But I also encourage you, and I will point you to uh, some of the other recordings that we have, some additional content that we have to dive deeper. And as Jim said in the intro, always consider us a resource. Uh, that's who we are. That's what we do. Feel free to send me an email, partake in the hour of consulting. Now, while I'm saying send me an email, I should also say, please send the email to uh, uh, my guys uh, as well, Ian, Jim Duffy, who's email is on a, on one of those slides and those slides you can download because I've been so overloaded with emails in part because of data.net that I'm way behind. So some of you may have sent me an email. I'm not ignoring you. I probably still have it in my inbox. I will get to it eventually, but you get a much, much quicker answer uh, if you contact Jim or Ian and, uh, and I'm not deliberately ignoring you, I promise. So anyway, we got a lot to talk about, so let's get started and dive into the actual content. And let's start with an Azure overview. Now, I understand that some of you that are attending this talk, uh, and I've seen people from all around the world, you're probably at different stages in, in adopting the cloud. Some of you may be living in the cloud. Some of you may have a mixture, which is very, very common. Some of you may not have taken the plunge yet. And so we'll start at the beginning. For those of you who are not at that level, bear with me, we're, we're getting to the more advanced stuff. So, so what is Azure actually? Well, Azure is Microsoft's cloud offering geared towards, towards developers and system builders. So in, in a way, everyone who builds something uh, on top of a cloud, that's who the Azure cloud is geared towards. It's actually a collection of over 260 individual services at this point, plus third-party offerings as well. And that's this number is rapidly growing. Now, how do you keep up with that? Well, I think the short answer is you don't because not all of these services 
are significant to every developer, to every IT person. So it's kind of like saying, how do you keep up with everything that's going on in the world of Windows? Well, you don't. You don't understand every app that's out there and every service that's out there. You only understand the ones that are important to you. But it's an interesting number to know, 260 plus services. And it's kind of interesting to actually uh, think about what Azure is for Microsoft internally, because Microsoft actually does not have a product called Azure. The one thing you won't find within Microsoft is the Azure team or something like that, because Azure itself is really just this collection of all these individual sub teams and services. Uh, so you will find the team that builds the, the app service hosting, the, the running websites in the cloud. You'll find the team that does uh, machine learning. You'll find the team that does IoT uh, and so on and so on. But you won't find a single group that's called the Azure group. And in fact, this Azure effort is now everywhere within the Microsoft organization. There isn't, I, I don't think, a single team that doesn't have anything to do with cloud computing because it's just ubiquitous. At this point, Microsoft really has succeeded or, or is a long way towards this goal of making Azure the world's computer. And what does that mean? That means that there is this tremendous processing power that sits out in the cloud. It doesn't matter to us where it sits, but what matters to us is that it's available to us for processing. We can access this incredible amount of power, this unimaginable amount of power through a window that's given to us. That's our desktop PCs, that's our mobile devices, that's our IT devices, that's our watches, that you know, any device at this point is really a front end to this tremendous amount of computing power. And that's extremely interesting when you think about it like that that every human being, if we give them just a little device like that, has access to all this power and can trigger all these things. And to us as developers or even IT uh, admin type of people, this is what makes all this tick. It's available to us and it's tremendously exciting because you can do so many things on top of that platform that simply would not have been available before. Now, that is also true with other clouds. Uh, obviously, the, the big elephant in the room uh, is that there's other clouds that are also very important. We've had Stata.nets that dealt with AWS, for instance. As we'll see here in a moment, AWS is uh, arguably the biggest cloud in the world um, and then followed by Azure. Although in a way, Azure is the more complete cloud. It's a more complete story, I think, rather than just um, metal that does a lot for you. Now, that's not entirely fair to say that, but my point is, Azure is just a very complete overall story that provides a lot and it plays well with others. That's also very important. So if you are buying into Azure, that doesn't mean you can't also take advantage of Google's cloud or AWS or, or many other clouds or even on-premise and local devices and, and the edge scenarios. So um, that in a nutshell is what Azure is or what Azure is meant to be. Now, in a way that means a lot, in a, in a way you're probably still going, yeah, but, but what does that mean specifically for me? How do I use things? And that's what we'll take a look at here in a moment. But before that, let's take a look at the bigger picture. And the bigger picture from a Microsoft point of view is the Microsoft Cloud. So you will sometimes hear these two different terms. You'll hear about Microsoft Azure and you hear about the Microsoft Cloud. The Microsoft Cloud is actually bigger than just Azure. Uh, Azure is, as I said, the offering for the developers and the, the builders, if you will. But then there's all this other stuff that Microsoft does these days that is also based on top of Azure or on top of the cloud infrastructure that shares a lot with Azure, but is actually separate. So things like GitHub, for instance, the world's largest developer community that's now owned by Microsoft. Uh, the Microsoft Power BI platform, uh, Microsoft 365 with things like Office 365. LinkedIn, obviously, is a very big part of this. The Microsoft Dynamics 365 platform. And then all the security that spans all of that. And that's actually a, a huge piece of the puzzle is that security, that identity, that compliance, and all these very, very difficult concepts that everybody always needs but nobody really wants to deal with 
they're just always there and they're shared across all these pieces of the Microsoft Cloud, including Azure, which is important from our point of view. Uh, so that's just interesting to know what are these terms, right? And, and this, that this stuff is just bigger than just Azure, as if Azure wasn't big enough already. Um, but you know, just the fact that Microsoft is using these same pieces in their own uh, offerings that they are offering to enterprises or consumers, I think is a very interesting piece of the puzzle. Now, when we look at the overall cloud market, uh, first of all, well, we know that cloud grew tremendously in 2020. And part of that was COVID and the crisis that was going on because it accelerated the move to the cloud. It accelerated the build out of many things such as networking infrastructure and bandwidth and processing power in particular. Uh, but in general, clouds have been growing at a tremendous pace. And the biggest players in this are, like I said, AWS, uh, just in terms of the value of business that a cloud does, AWS is ahead of Microsoft. Um, Microsoft is a very solid number two, and as a number two growing much faster than AWS. So it's been that gap's been closing little by little. Uh, and in a way, it doesn't really matter. What matters is that we have two tremendously important clouds that play well together. And this concept of multi-cloud is getting much, much more important. Why would you use multiple clouds, by the way? Well, there's many reasons to do so. One of them would be that a certain service that runs on a certain cloud is just very appealing to people. So for instance, if you like machine learning and AI, maybe the Microsoft Cloud is the best place to be. If you like advanced search, maybe the elastic search capabilities on AWS are great. Although I would argue maybe you're better off with Microsoft there too with the Microsoft search offering. Uh, but the point is you have different offerings on different clouds. And this is, so people choose that for that reason. It may be that in a large organization, different departments choose different clouds for various reasons. It may be that this has uh, grown in a natural way, maybe due to acquisitions. But the bottom line is, Multi-cloud setups are very, very common these days. And cloud providers, especially Microsoft, but not just Microsoft, are now realizing that this is an important scenario. And so many of the things they are building specifically take the multi-cloud approach in, um, in consideration. So for instance, if you're using Microsoft's uh, Azure Active Directory offering, uh, you can use that to manage things on non-Microsoft clouds. And uh, when we say multi-cloud, by the way, we usually also refer uh, to edge cases and on-premise databases. So if you're still running your own data center, many of these cloud services may still be useful to you just in managing your own data center uh, or edge devices, which are, you know, or, or IoT devices even. Uh, anyway, so the two big clouds are AWS and Microsoft Azure. Um, Google Cloud is, a distant third. At some point, they would have said Google Cloud almost didn't matter, but the Google Cloud has uh, developed nicely as well. They're, they're growing pretty quickly lately. And so that's uh, certainly the third most interesting offering. But when you look at the absolute numbers, you see that that's still pretty far behind. And uh, you know, then we got Alibaba in Asia. Uh, a slightly different way of looking at this is uh, this approach here, which gives us uh, uh, the share of the cloud infrastructure spend. And you see AWS is about a third of what's going on. Microsoft's about 20%. So between the two of them, they share more than half of the cloud market. And then Google, Alibaba, and the single digits, and then all the others make up about one third. Uh, so, you know, that these numbers change a little bit depending on who did the market research. Uh, but by and large, these are the proportions that you will see. Now we can take a step back even further and look at the even bigger picture when it comes to Azure, because one of the things that I think is extremely interesting with Azure is not just is Azure as part of the bigger Microsoft cloud, but Microsoft is the only provider in the world that has this much bigger ecosystem. The fact that Microsoft is the developer of Visual Studio and .NET and Visual Studio Code and who knows how many different developer products and, and the core developer of things like SQL Server and, and Cosmos DB. And yes, you get some of that on, on the Amazon cloud as well, 
but you certainly don't have Amazon as the key developer behind many programming languages. Um, it's more of a natural growth thing, while Microsoft is more the pusher and the maker behind a lot of that stuff. Uh, so it makes for a very interesting overall developer ecosystem because not just as Microsoft built the cloud pieces, but they also built the tools with it in a very, very uh, massive and well-organized way. So that makes it somewhat unique or, or very unique uh, in the whole developer ecosystem. Now, when we talk about building for the cloud, one of these concepts that's becoming more and more important is this concept of cloud native. What does cloud native even mean? Well, it's one of those terms that if you ask 10 people, you probably get 11 definitions. But the simplest way to think about cloud native is something that is built first and foremost for the cloud, where the entire architecture, the entire mindset of building something is entirely based on cloud techniques and cloud architecture. So instead of saying, okay, I'm a SQL Server developer and, and I'm building some services and how do we scale that? You just immediately start out using cloud-based databases, using cloud-based infrastructure for your middle tier, for your microservices, for deploying, for managing and orchestrating these microservices, for taking advantage of a global infrastructure, for global fail-safe mechanisms. So that is what I would say cloud native is. And the reason cloud native is important to us is that we do now see a wave of cloud native apps. We saw a first and a second wave of adoption with, uh, with all the clouds. And the second wave was a lot more geared towards the cloud. But I would now say we, we are heading into a third wave of adoption. And this is where people now really get this concept of building specific to the cloud and still making that abstract enough where it's not just tied into a single cloud. And we'll talk about that uh, more later as well. Um, and so we are seeing this wave now where many, many software products that have been around for a while are now taking this leap into creating something that's from the ground up architected for cloud operations rather than kind of fitting uh, a square peg in a round hole by, by repurposing all the software for the cloud. And that's uh, interesting also to, to understand for those of you who are building products that you're selling to enterprises or businesses or even consumers is that we're now seeing this. And if you are, I mean, I don't want to sound too pushy here, but you have to keep this in mind that probably most of your competitors are doing this. And and you'll probably look old relatively soon if you can't also talk about this approach. So that's significant. Now, in some ways, people always say, well, you know, we've now done this cloud thing for a while. Uh, isn't this a fad? Hasn't this passed? Aren't we like already mostly over the hump with this? Haven't people mostly moved into the cloud? Uh, in other words, have we reached peak cloud? That's been the term that people have used for that. Um, and I don't think so. Most people don't think so. In fact, Scott Guthrie, who is in charge of all things cloud at Microsoft, thinks we're maybe 15% there on this journey to reaching peak cloud. Uh, and a, a lot of that has to do with this cloud native approach where, yes, you may be running some stuff on the cloud, but there's this whole wave coming of old software getting replaced with this completely new way of doing native development on the cloud. And then it goes even further, and that's edge-based computing, which is the things that happen on the fringes or the edge of the cloud, right? Things that may not always run in the cloud, things that may be out in the field, IoT devices, partially connected scenarios, uh, sub-data centers that are sometimes connected to the cloud, but not ever. Data centers that are never collected, connected to the cloud, but still want to take advantage of exactly the same infrastructure and the features that happen in the cloud. We are seeing things that are partially run in the cloud, like machine learning things that are trained in the cloud, but then used on the edge without necessarily a connection to the cloud. And that's a, a very nascent development. Uh, yes, a lot of that's going on already, but the potential for that is humongous. So. Uh, if you haven't moved into the cloud yet, or you kind of dabbled in it and, and you're not yet, uh, or haven't yet made this jump into cloud native and doing everything, uh, based on the cloud, uh, don't fret. You're not the only one, but a lot of this is still going to happen. And 
And as I just throw this out, right, I'm just saying, oh, well, not everybody is doing everything cloud based yet. Some people may say, well, I don't even want that. I, I don't want to do everything cloud based and I don't want to give my data to large cloud providers. And, and we'll talk about that as well. But it's not just about that. It's also about taking the technology that is driving the cloud and bringing that back somewhere else if you're uncomfortable leaving things in the cloud. But even if you're just doing everything on-prem, if you're doing everything in your own, uh, on your own infrastructure, in your own office, for instance, uh, you still want to take advantage of those features. You still want to get a lot of the management capabilities. You want the same SDKs, the general same feature sets. So even if you never do anything on the Microsoft Cloud, you probably still want to understand a lot of the features uh, that are available in that environment. And by the way, I'm always looking over here to the side a little bit. I have my minions online looking for questions you may raise, and they are trying to answer those as well. But I'm also monitoring over here if any questions are coming my way, and I'll try to answer some along the way if they arise. Uh, and then we'll take some time at the end as well uh, to answer more questions. Now, I don't want to talk a whole lot more about COVID and the current crisis, uh, but I will talk about this in this one more slide that I have here. Uh, because COVID has been a major driving force when it comes to cloud development. Now, a lot of the things that are going on in that arena have been going on for a long time. And there were certain trends that we saw before, like the bring your own device trend, uh, the, the work from home every now and then uh, trend. Um, but because of COVID, I think we've seen that being accelerated. Uh, so the trends are not necessarily new, but they have been pushed forward. And a lot of these things will stick around. Now, it's a big debate at this point. Will we go back to working a lot in the office? Will we stay uh, more distributed? I think what's clear at this point is, that some of those things are gonna to stay to some extent. I think that's not even debated at this point. So the fact that you can work from home and meet over an online meeting and get stuff done can't be disputed anymore because we've seen this happening. And so this older work model that was slowly degrading this, this model of going to the office eight to five that was really a holdover from the old factory days in the industrial revolution uh, that is clearly not the only way to work. Let me put it like that. And the technology that has been developed around that with virtual presence uh, and just things you can now do remotely, nobody's going to say, hey, this will never work because we've now proven that it works. So I think what we will see longer term is that, yes, we'll go back to some extent work in the office some um, uh, but we'll probably also work from home a lot more with, with more flexibility and using cloud technologies to support that. Um, and that will lead to things like integrating Microsoft Teams, integrating many other services that have now become available to us. A uh, question online is, how does Azure compare to the Google Cloud in terms of jo job market demand? I'm having a little bit of a hard time answering that question because we don't hire that much for, for Google type of stuff. We, we, we do a lot of AWS, we do a lot of uh, Azure. We haven't been doing that much Google stuff. Um, my gut feel, this is just me speaking off the top of my head, is that there's a lot of demand for AWS and there's also a lot of demand uh, for the Microsoft stuff and probably a little less for Google, but it's still a considerable size uh, market. So if you're looking for new things to learn, I'd look at AWS and Microsoft stuff first to make yourself valuable, but it probably wouldn't be a horrible mistake to go with the Google stuff either. And like I said, they're kind of up and coming a little bit. They've made a good inroads over the last year or two. So let's dive into some of the Azure infrastructure. Uh, always a fascinating topic to me because it is absolutely flabbergasting how big the infrastructure is that sits behind Azure. And of course, a lot of that starts with the data centers. And so I just grabbed a few pictures that were available to me to give you an idea of the scale 
of a Microsoft data center at this point. So this is what we're talking about here is warehouse size facilities that host one server that, that are packed uh, to the uh, maximum with server banks and, and hardware network infrastructure. Uh, so this is a data center in Quincy. Actually, these photos are not totally news of these things. They've probably grown a little bit more, but look at the size of this thing. It's multiple warehouses full of computers. Uh, the Cheyenne uh, facility, for instance, the facility in Dublin, uh, very, very massive undertakings. The facility in Amsterdam, look at these warehouses, they just full of Microsoft computers. So at this point, you see a, a warehouse facility like this in, in the Netherlands, it's either used to grow something, tulips we're talking about, uh, or it's a Microsoft facility like this. Uh, so uh, just amazing scale of what's going on. And when you think of what's going on in these warehouses that are full of computers, it's not just the, the massive amount of, of server infrastructure that goes into it and, and cooling and power demand, uh, but it's also about things like physical security. It, it's absolutely amazing to me what Microsoft does with that. Uh, so for instance, in these warehouses, they're not telling us exactly what's going on, but what I can tell you is that you would very likely not be able to get in. And if you got in for whatever reason, you would, it would be a very, very secure environment, uh, down to the point that you couldn't take in anything that's metal. Uh, you couldn't wear pants that have... Uh, any kind of metal uh, buttons or anything like that on them. Uh, you wouldn't be able to take anything out. Uh, no piece of hardware ever leaves these facilities. These facilities have massive shredders uh, that entire server banks can be thrown into. I was told by somebody uh, they have hardware shredders where they could put a, a Volkswagen bug into the whole thing, the whole car, and it would shred it into pieces. That's the kind of hardware we're talking about there. And those are security features, so nobody could ever walk off with a server bank, with a hard drive, or anything like that. Uh, so amazingly secure environments. Not something that you or I could ever do in our own data centers. Like in the first, in the early days of the cloud, I was always thinking, okay, so the cloud is kind of cool, but do I really want to give my data to Microsoft? How secure is that, really? The reality is this is tremendously secure. I could never do anything like this uh, on my own. And, and we've become the victim of a, a relatively massive cyber attack a year and a half ago. And we didn't do anything stupid. Uh, we had our act together. Uh, we even managed to fight it off reasonably well. But it has become clear how much safer our stuff would be in the cloud. And that's when we, we moved pretty much everything we had into the cloud and haven't had any problems since. So Microsoft can just do things and Amazon can do things at a scale that even large organizations, uh, you know, we are working with Fortune 500 companies on a regular basis that have their own data centers, but it's certainly nothing like these data centers I'm showing you here that Microsoft has. And we'll talk about how many there are in a moment. Uh, but again, it's a mind boggling number. Uh, Microsoft also invests into things like modular data centers uh, for uh, resiliency in the field, uh, for being able to respond to disasters, deploying data centers into fields, uh, recovering if there's an area where a natural disaster happened. Uh, so Microsoft has these modular data centers that are basically uh, the size of a shipping container. They can be put on a truck. Uh, they perfectly fit just like a container does. These are again filled with server banks. They're filled with things like liquid cooling, the they have their built-in shock absorbers so they can operate uh, and be delivered to places without taking damage. They have their own satellite uplink. They're amazing pieces of engineering that can be deployed in masses, not just one at a time, but many, many of those containers at a time can be deployed into the field to provide compute power quickly where it is needed and to recover from things uh, as, as they arise. So it's another very interesting piece of the puzzle. So for us, we're mortals that are sitting at the computer writing their programs. It is absolutely mind boggling to understand the scale of everything that's going on. And Microsoft is on the absolute forefront of this. Uh, now, if we look at the number of places that Microsoft has these types of things around the world, 
we are now at 65 regions around the world and counting. Uh, that's more uh, than AWS and Google combined. So Microsoft is on the absolute forefront of building all of this. Now you could say it depends on how you slice and dice regions and so on. And, and maybe AWS makes different claims. But uh, the point is, this is a massive effort. Now, when we talk about Azure regions, and there's more and more regions coming on, uh, a region is not the same as the data center, as we will discover. A region is actually a collection of data centers, but it's an abstraction that sits on top of a physical data center to make it more manageable. Uh, now, regions can also be country specific. We've had quite a lot of new countries come on recently. I think there's nine countries that came on, many in Europe, uh, like Austria and, and many others. Uh, that now have their own regions, places like Mexico, Israel, New Zealand, Chile, Indonesia, that the list grows and grows all the time. At this point, there's practically no big country in the world without their own physical data center and region. So is that its own data center in, in, in the Vatican? No, but every major country in the world at this point has its own Microsoft data center. And that's tremendously important for a very specific reason. And that is that data sovereignty and, and residency needs have become a major topic in, uh, dot, in, in cloud development. Uh, so one of the main issues why people wouldn't move to the cloud is that countries are getting more and more protective and create more and more laws around where data has to reside. And now it's not just about where the data resides, but it's also about where data is processed. So if you deal with, let's say, Germany, and Germany has very specific laws around where the data needs to be, you can't just say, okay, I'm using the Microsoft data center in Germany, uh, and, and the data can't even be owned or hosted by Microsoft in Germany because Microsoft's an international company, but Microsoft has partnerships with local companies in Germany where Microsoft just makes the data center but has no access to it. Only the German company that they're partnering with has access to it. But it's even beyond that. Now it's also that you can't load that data even temporarily into memory potentially and process it on a machine that's outside of, in this case, in this example, Germany, right? So this, this data residency problem in a way has grown, but it's also shrunk because Microsoft uh, has fixed this by adding so many data centers. So this, this worry for us developers has largely gone away. For Microsoft, that's a very big worry, obviously. Uh, and that's why they're adding so many data centers. And they have added about 50 to 100 data centers per year, and I expect it to continue at this pace. So when you think back to the pictures I showed you of those data centers, they're adding about 100 of those a year. Every three days, if you want to think of it like that, three to four days, a new data center like that comes online and gets absorbed into the overall Azure, Azure region infrastructure. So that's to me just absolutely incredible. Uh, Scott Guthrie at some point told me uh, he would have never thought this, that, that as a, a manager at Microsoft, he would ever worry about how quick con concrete can dry. But that's the things they're dealing with because they're churning these data centers out so quickly. Um, now, these regions are organized in availability zones. That's another important thing to understand. When you have a, an Azure region, that region is usually bound by a geography. So you may have different regions in the US, the South Central region, the, the region, the West region, and, and so on. Now, these regions, like I said, are not just single data centers, but they are collections of data centers, so-called availability zones. These are data centers that for uh, network performance reasons are no further apart than 100 kilometers and they form clusters of data centers and if one of those data centers goes down maybe because of the power outage maybe a hurricane hit or whatever else the region still stays up and operational because there's multiple data centers uh, that make up a, a region and this is now something that Microsoft's doing for every region they have in the past it was more like okay well we got the uh, Northern Ireland region, and that was just one data center, but that's now not happening anymore. We are moving into much more 
uh, clustered regions and, and availability zones. So that's another interesting thing to know. Okay. Uh, in general, security and privacy is getting more and more important. That's also one of the things that's been pushed by COVID uh, is this idea of absolute zero trust. That means you don't trust people to, to log into a VPN or anything like that, and then you assume they're good actors, but you always assume everybody who accesses your stuff, you just cannot trust. And then what is the security model that arises out of that? So that's what most cloud providers uh, are now doing with the security and privacy um, compliance and, and general initiatives. So uh, again, distributed working, uh, distributed companies working from home, uh, but also IoT and other things, other trends facilitate that particular uh, trend that we're now seeing overall. Now, another thing that's very important is these data centers consume a lot of power. And that's problematic for a number of reasons. Uh, one is it consumes a lot of power. Where do you get that power from? Uh, another is a lot of power means a lot of heat. How can you most efficiently deal with that in your data center? And you can go online at, the, at Ignite. There were some very interesting sessions around that, just how Microsoft deals with uh, liquid cooling, for instance, how they're making great steps forward not air cooling these data centers and not wasting all the space within a data center by having these hallways through the server banks so the circulation can happen, but by actually water cooling or liquid cooling, I should say, a lot of these machines that are in there and that saves them a ton of space. It makes everything more efficient. Um, and then of course, the final problem is carbon emissions and carbon footprint and then global warming. And Microsoft has committed to not just becoming carbon neutral, but, but by becoming carbon negative uh, over the whole lifetime of the company. So Microsoft has promised to take carbon out of the atmosphere and either repurpose that or, or store it somewhere. Going back to the beginning of Microsoft, everything they put in the atmosphere, they want to take as much of that out of it and then go beyond that and becoming carbon negative. And that's an effort that you can read up on as well. I don't want to spend a lot of time on it. But I think it's very interesting uh, that they are doing that and that they are very, on a very good path for that. Because, of course, these hundreds of hundreds of data centers are very, very big power, power consumers. And it's an interesting aspect that is both good for the environment, the way they're doing it, but it's also good for the efficiency of the data centers, uh, that they can simply run the data centers more efficient and, and overclock things more and run things faster because they're doing that. Another thing that I want to mention real quick uh, is Azure Orbital. Uh, this is not something I personally do anything with or, or have a lot of knowledge about, but I find it fascinating, is that Azure is not just a ground-based network type of thing, but it's also that Microsoft's working uh, with satellite providers and doing um, basically cloud in, in space, uh, which is important for various reasons. Uh, can have to do with actual Earth observations, but it also has to do with global communications. It has to do with being able to provide network connectivity in ways that otherwise you couldn't. It has to do with things like those uh, data centers in a container that we've seen. Uh, so very interesting from plain infrastructure need to an actual service that we can use as developers. So in a way, this is one of the first services we're looking at here. So this, I just wanted to mention that so you get an idea uh, of course, Azure is also huge on land-based infrastructure and network infrastructure. In other words, subsea cables, cross-continental the cables. Uh, there's some stats out there as to how many hundreds or thousands of miles Microsoft has laid cables for. I mean, they're spanning the globe, I don't know how many times now, with the amount of subsea cables Microsoft has laid themselves. So, so this is just to give you an idea of the scale of things that we are dealing with. And, and I'm still just scratching the surface. I'm still probably doing a very poor job at giving you a true impression of the scale, but it is just massive, right? That's, that's the key takeaway there, I would say. So let's uh, go hands-on a little bit. Uh, let's move away from these interesting act, uh, aspects of Azure to what can we do with Azure? Now I'm assuming that at this point, most people have taken a look at Azure or some other clouds in some capacity. As developers, you basically need to know Azure is a large connect collection of services that you can use. 
Azure has a very good single interface into all these services, and I'll show you that in just in a, in a moment. And you can start exploring. And then it's simplest. I think for a developer, the easiest way to think of Azure is just this great computer, big computer out there in the cloud that allows you to run your stuff. And, and the easiest concept there, I think, is the concept of a web app. Uh, so almost like an old day data center where you can just go and run your web app on a server that's hosted for you. That's what our first service is here that we're taking a look at. Again, I'm assuming that a lot of you have already seen this. We'll still take a very quick look at this. Uh, but that fundamentally is what we're talking about. So let's just uh, switch into my Azure portal that I've already opened up here. Not even going to go into a lot of detail here. I know the font's a little small. It doesn't matter. We're not going into that much detail. But the first thing you do if you've never done anything with Azure is you go to portal.azure.com. You, you establish a free account and you start poking around. And there's a ton of stuff you can do for free. For instance, you can create a hosted website for free. Now, how would you go about that? Well, the first thing you do is you click the create a resource button that's here. Uh, it's also over here. There's many different ways of creating a resource, but we'll just click this button here because it's just so obvious. And now I can go ahead and I can start exploring what I want to create. A resource in this sense is just a thing you can create in the cloud. And there's a few very popular things that I immediately displayed to us here. And the first thing you're gonna grab is just this web app. Now there's many different types of web apps we could create as we'll see. We could also explore many of these other things. It's a, it's a marketplace, you can poke around here uh, and then you won't get done. There's so many, it's, it's just, you, you'll never get to all of them. But we'll start with this web app here. And as you're creating a web app, we can first specify well, what kind of web app we want to build exactly and where does it go? And so I have an Azure subscription. Uh, I can group things together in so-called resource groups. This is just a logical organization. Uh, we can then go ahead and say, let's create a data.net uh, one uh, web application. And you'll see this, uh, this is the name of the app, but it gives us a default accessible names to the outside world. So this will be called state of .net one .azure websites net. That's a public domain that we can use. Now you'll probably configure your own domain later, but um, this is gonna be there by default. And now we can pick what exactly we want to run on this website. And as you can see, there's a ton of different things. For us as .net developers, .net 5 looks very appealing for instance, but there's lots and lots of other stuff. And if, if you've never dealt with Azure, uh, then this may come as a surprise to you how many different things Microsoft supports. It's not just Microsoft tech, but anything is fair game, basically. Um, so to us uh, that have used Azure a lot, this is now second nature, but people coming from just a more of a on-premise mindset, this may be unusual. So we pick .NET 5, we can then further pick, do we want a Windows or Linux deployment? Doesn't really matter at this point. Uh, we can also pick where and what general region we want to run this. I'm going to put this into South Central US here because that's where most of our stuff is running. Um, then I can pick the size of the operation I want to run here. Do I want a small machine? Is this going to be a small website that can be co-located possibly even for free? Uh, a lot of the smaller scale things are free. Uh, or is this something where I need thousands of servers spanning multiple regions and the, the globe and massive scale? Um, right now, I'm going to pick a small one. I could always scale that up later. I could then pick a few other things like do I want to enable continuous deployment? Do I want to run any stats on this? Um, and so on and so forth. But we're, we're just going with the defaults here and we hit create. Now, what this is going to do is it's going to stand up this infrastructure needed on the back office or, or in the cloud uh, that will allow us to run a new website. And if you just did this for the first time and you just came into this and created a free Azure account and are now deploying the site, it'll be barely taking you any longer than this has taken for me right now, right? So this is still going on. It does take, you know, maybe a minute or so, depending on how big your deployment is. And uh, it's almost done. And while this is going on, actually, 
Uh, it's almost finished, but uh, we'll immediately switch over to Visual Studio because this is the part that takes longer. And in Visual Studio, we'll say we'll create a new project here. And since we said it's uh, it was going to be a .NET 5 application, we're going to build a .NET 5 web app. And so I've looked at different things here. You know, I can pick uh, my my templates, as you know. But since I've done this recently, my project template for a .NET Core web app is at the very top here. I'm just going to pick that. I'm going to give it a name, data.net1. Put it in a local folder. I pick my runtime, .NET 5.0. has to fit the one that we had on the server. And we'll just go with the default here. We're not even going to pick anything. We could enable Docker deployments and containerization. It's something that you might want to do. For now, we'll just start with the basics and probably really doesn't matter all that much what we are doing exactly here. Now, meanwhile, we can probably switch back over here. Our deployment of the website has now finished. We can go to this resource and we can look up various things and we can now manage this resource through this portal here. Now, remember this because I'll tell you some other things in the future related to this. But for now, we just have our website here and it's at this public location and we can click on that. And hey, here's our first web app. It's just a placeholder. You can all, as you're watching this session, at least the ones watching live, can now go to this and you would see the same exact website. This is now live for the world to see. Now I'll take it down later. So if you're watching this as a recording on demand, this may be gone, but for now, this is already there, okay? Uh, so let's go back to Visual Studio. Here is our simple ASP.NET website. We'll start a build for this. And we can run this locally and you'd see the default ASP.NET website. But what we ultimately want to do is we want to deploy this to Azure. And so one of the things we can do here back in the portal is this button here that says, get the publish profile. And this will download a file uh, into my, my download files that'll help us from Visual Studio uh, setting up the deployment. And over here, our build has completed. We can now right click and we can publish this. And a lot of people will say, hey, wait a minute, Marcus, don't, don't do that. You're supposed to do fancy continuous integration or DevOps or whatever. That's true. But for now, we'll just do this uh, the manual way. And so we pick the publish option here and see that uh, as you've never published this before, it says, well, configure this. You need to tell me where this is going to go. And I could set up all kinds of things. I could configure Azure manually. And this integrates very well. So if I'm logged in, it knows what Azure accounts I have. It would find this resource. But an easy way is to just import this published profile. So we just go into wherever this downloaded. And here is that published file. And we can now go ahead and finish this and start our deployment to the website. Now, this is going to take a moment because this is going to do some .NET restores and so on. But you have now seen soup to nuts how you could essentially get into the portal, start a completely new website, start a completely new development project, and then start publishing this to the cloud. Now, this is the simplest way we can go, but it's a realistic thing that, that you could absolutely do. Now, there's tons of other ways of how we can now improve on that and use different services that Azure provides us. Uh, if you watched last month's data.net, we talked about Azure DevOps, for instance, uh, or DevOps in general, and, and that would be one way of deploying to Azure. Uh, there's ways to automate the creation of these resources. We'll talk about that in a moment as well. Um, but this is, this is doable, right? If you have a small website, you don't always have to go the real fancy DevOps route and all that. Uh, you can absolutely do this. And so all of you can now go to this website, to this URL and see my very simple ASP.NET Core 5 website that is now deployed for the world to see. And again, I can configure custom domains and I'm not going to do that because I don't have the time. Uh, but this is, is a first example of how this sort of stuff works. So that's app services. Obviously that's something that every developer should know. You can do this for websites, you do this for services, all kinds of stuff. 
A slightly similar but related topic is static web apps. As it turns out, when you build web apps that use things like Angular or Vue or Blazor or any of those things that run on the client, then maybe you don't need a fancy .NET Core 5 uh, or .NET 6 backend that runs everything on the server and, and then serves up the finished product and it's relatively large and heavy on the server, even though it's been highly optimized in recent times. Uh, but maybe all you need is a bunch of static files that get served up uh, to the client and then maybe that app running in the client calls other services on the back end. And that is uh, what we can use Azure Static Web Apps for. So that's a second service. It's similar to the service we just created, but it's more lightweight and it also has some interesting characteristics like automatic uh, tight GitHub integration. So as you're using GitHub uh, to manage your source code, you can set up things like uh, as you publish a certain branch or push a certain branch into GitHub, it would automatically deploy to the static web apps uh, setup. So a pretty interesting thing to do, play around with it, very similar to play around with the thing that we just did. Now, another thing that's probably very uh, familiar to most developers is just the need to create databases, uh, SQL Server databases being one of them. Uh, there is many different options to run SQL databases on Azure. One of them is you can actually create a virtual machine that you run and then run SQL on it. Okay, so that's regular SQL Server, if you want to think of it like that, running on a virtual machine. And by the way, you can create virtual machines like crazy on the cloud, which means you can create just about anything that you can think of hosted in the cloud as a virtual machine and, and quite efficiently so. But it's not as efficient as running cloud native things. So when it comes to running SQL Server, if you can, I would recommend that you run SQL Azure. SQL Azure is a purpose-built version of SQL Server that, that's not in a virtual machine where you didn't have to pay for the whole virtual machine, but it's just a SQL Server. You don't care, does, does it take 50 servers to run this? Does it take a fifth of a server that you share with other people? It's just SQL Azure in the cloud. Uh, and you then create databases on it and you scale it and you pay for it as you go. Uh, and it's, it's a very efficient way to run SQL Server. That's how we run practically all our SQL Service these days. And it's easy to do in general. If you understand SQL Server, SQL Azure is not a big le learning curve. So that would be the recommendation there. Now, when we talk about things like data, a related topic would be Azure Storage. Uh, Azure Storage provides us multiple different ways of storing things in the cloud that are not structured data. So we could be talking about blobs like files. Uh, we could be talking about very simple tables. So almost like a, like a think of it as just rows and columns, but nothing uh, relational. Right. So, so what we use this for is, is a lot of blob storage, for instance. So we put uh, files that we want to display on websites like images or download files. Or uh, when we publish uh, Code Magazine, we have these large files that we need to send to the printers. Uh, those are just stored in blobs. In the old days, we put them into SQL Server where we kept them around because we often had to go back. And now we just store them cheaply into this blob storage which is much, much cheaper than uh, true SQL uh, server storage would be. It's just more suitable for data like that. Uh, it's automatically backed up. It can be automatically replicated. It can be geo-replicated. So if this is uh, publicly accessible, which you may or may not want to make these things, and you have the option, uh, but say uh, images that show up on a website, you may want to geo-replicate so it's uh, accessible in all regions at its highest performance level. So very cost-efficient way to just store stuff. And you can even think of this as a file system. You can even mount a drive where this just shows up like it was a big drive in the sky for you. Now going back to compute, Azure Functions is huge there. This is an interesting concept uh, this is also often referred to as serverless computing. Horrible name in a way, a uh, great name in other ways. What serverless means is uh, it's, it's that, that definitely does not mean that there's no servers. Uh, it, it means there's probably oodles of servers, but you don't have to worry about them. It's you just want to run some stuff. You don't care how many servers it takes to run it. 
I just don't even want to think about the infrastructure. Just go ahead and run this for me. That's what serverless computing basically means. And Azure Functions is one such uh, service that uses that. So what is an Azure function? Well, think of a service. Let's say you build a service uh, that returns customer data or that allows uh, uploading a photo of a customer or some, some typical service you might uh, create. You could create that as an ASP.NET uh, type of web API REST-based service that you then deploy as an app service, or you could deploy the almost same thing as an Azure function. In fact, it's, if you are a C-sharp developer, the development of that thing would be almost not totally identical, but very similar to building a REST-based web service, a little simpler than building a REST-based web service. But you can build these Azure functions in any number of languages, say JavaScript and many others, uh, you can write small things just right in the portal that I showed you, but more likely you do this in your development environment and then publish into it. And this is a very nice pay for use model. So if you build a function or some service that is only accessed once a week, well, you're not paying for that server all the time. You're only paying for it when it's accessed. So you could think of this as, you know, maybe an alternative to building a, a service-based infrastructure but it can also respond to all kinds of other things. This can be event driven. It can happen on a timer. So maybe you want to kick off something once a week to consolidate your data, whatever the case might be. You could build that as an Azure function and it could let the Azure function infrastructure deal with the scheduling of that. That's just built in. Or you could respond to events. Maybe somebody uploaded a file into the blob storage we just talked about. Well, you could create a function that responds to that. Uh, somebody's asking online, the way I publish the site, is that the, is that the web, the, the latest way to publish? Uh, well, the web deploy through Visual Studio, the way I did it, where you just click and publish. Yes, it is the latest way if you want to do a simple type of publish, but there's many other ways. And, and a lot of people would tell you don't ever publish like that. You should have a, a better process. There should be a DevOps thing. There should be continuous integration and all that stuff. Personally, this is not a religious issue for me. I, I don't think badly about people that do that. And we have some small websites where we actually do it like this, right? And if that works for you, that's great, right? But if you have a bigger team working on stuff, more complex setups, you probably want to use a little bit more of a sophisticated, structured way to deploy. And, and there's several ways of doing that. Um, anyway, returning to the functions thing, one related topic that I want to bring up here is a relatively new service called Azure Event Grid. This is related to functions, but it's actually a separate service. So this idea to trigger a function or anything else for that matter, when something happens, like a text message comes in, a file is added, uh, whatever, right? Uh, uh, IoT device sends us an event, the concept that we want to react to that in a very flexible way has been fleshed out in this thing called Azure Event Grid. So Azure Event Grid allows us to very flexibly set up what are the publishers of events. Uh, then there's this consolidator in the middle and then you can very flexibly set up what responds to these events. Azure Functions could be one thing. Your web app could be another thing. Uh, your container, I haven't talked about containers yet today. That's not because containers aren't important, but containers are super important. It just, we talked a lot about that before. But so you could have something in a container that gets triggered. Maybe you have something that comes in from an IoT device that's not a Microsoft device, but it's uh, sending us stuff through the HTTP protocol. We then use Azure Event Grid in the middle to uh, uh, notice that this event happened and have one generic place to say, okay, let's say this, this I don't know, uh, moisture sensing system that is in charge of sprinkling our plantation, watering our plantation, sent us that the soil is not wet enough. We now have this shared place where this event registers, and now we could have all these handlers that are responding to this event. And these handlers may be on the Microsoft Cloud, they may be on the AWS cloud that uh, Amazon runs, it may be on some on-premise data center, it may be some other IoT device that now triggers the, the irrigation system to actually water the plants. 
Um, it doesn't matter where these things are. It's a very large concept, but this Azure event grid in the middle consolidates all of that and makes all of this possible. So it's a continuation of some of the early ideas with Azure Functions that are just on a much, much larger scale. So it's kind of interesting. Now, going back to this deployment idea, when I deploy a, a web app, we saw the simplest way to do that. Uh, but a more sophisticated way that a lot of people are doing these days is containers. Containers, when you need them, are great. They're these self-contained units. They have everything in them. They're not colliding with anything else. It's very easy to take these containers, at least in concept, and deploy them to a very large number of different systems, scale them up, uh, move them into different geographic locations, and so on. The question becomes, how do you do that? Um, and so you need some system, some tool to orchestrate that to set up these scripts to decide how to deploy and, and everything that goes around uh, that, that concept. And that is what Azure Kubernetes uh, or Azure Kubernetes service is all about. It's the service uh, that's an open standard. It's not a Microsoft thing, although Microsoft uh, contributes a lot to it. Uh, but this Kubernetes service allows us to orchestrate uh, our containers in various ways. And again, this is a multi-cloud concept. This is not just an Azure, but you can use Azure Kubernetes service to orchestrate all these containers. So there's some people that set up nothing in Azure other than an Active Directory infrastructure in Azure and a Kubernetes service to manage their containers that run in completely different universes, uh, self-hosted or on a different cloud. That's another interesting example. Uh, and then it goes even beyond that. Another service that's very interesting uh, is Azure Arc. Arc is this all-encompassing cloud management system uh, that's not just about containers, but also about all kinds of other resources, servers, and, and, and all kinds of things. And again, multi-cloud, not just the cloud that's, uh, or not just the infrastructure that's in Azure, but the infrastructure that's in the own data centers and AWS, Google, and who knows what else. Uh, clouds and data centers. So that's how that all plays together. Now, going back a little more to the development side of things, one of the problems with the cloud is that as you're building these cloud native apps, you're often tying yourself very closely to specific services and technologies. So for instance, how do you store blobs? Okay, you're using Azure Blob Storage. Uh, or maybe how do you store loosely structured data, a document database? Well, maybe you're going with Cosmos DB on Azure, but you're now tying yourself to these things. And what if you want to deploy this somewhere else or, or a multi-cloud deployment? And, and why do you even have to worry about all these little uh, implementation specific things? And if you want to get away from that, you can use Dapper. Dapper is a new thing that is rapidly gaining in significance and importance and adoption. Dapper stands for Distributed Application Runtime, and it's a runtime environment specifically made for cloud native applications to provide that abstraction layer to uh, make the learning curve flatter and, and just provide this runtime environment without having to worry about what the, the underlying things are so much. Uh, it helps you build multi-cloud apps, distributed apps. It also helps you to not be tied so much into a specific cloud environment and then you're trapped in there. Uh, so in that sense, I often think of this as something that's kind of counter to Microsoft in Microsoft's interest, but it's, it's in the interest of people that build for the cloud. Uh, now I mentioned Cosmos DB, so I should also say what that is. Uh, this is an alternative to SQL Server, if you want to think of it like that. It's a NoSQL database, but it's the first NoSQL database that's specifically engineered for the cloud. It's from the, from the ground up built to say, we're not dealing with servers. Uh, we're not dealing with anything like a physical database or anything like that. It's just, you're creating a database. It's hosted in the cloud. It's automatically replicated. It is limitless in size because it'll use however many servers and storage uh, that it needs. You're just managing your data. You're managing where you want to replicate your data geographically, but it is serverless in the sense that you'll never worry about a server. You never worry about how many servers you need and so on. Uh, so it's an it's a interesting massive scale database 
And it's also very interesting because it supports multiple APIs. You can kind of use this as if it was MongoDB or Cassandra or, or even SQL Server if you want to look at it more in a relational sense. And so you can kind of twist and turn this thing into what you need it to be. And it's just very good at storing data that's not quite as structured as say SQL Server data would necessarily be. Or often it's a combination of things that are structured and loosely structured. And, and so we are using this uh, with great success. It's a great database to use. Um, so wanted to mention that. Uh, what else do we have? DevOps. Can't talk about Azure without talking about DevOps. DevOps would be the better way to manage and deploy your projects, right? Rather than just, oh, here's my project, right-click deploy, you're putting this whole process on top of it that your team uses. It includes deployment, it includes source management, it includes management of work items and processes around that and all that sort of stuff. And a lot of it being done automated, automated builds, you're pushing into uh, your source control system and it kicks off testing processes and it, it kicks off deployments if it goes into the right uh, bucket and all that. Uh, and Microsoft has two significant offerings for that, Azure DevOps and GitHub. Okay? Uh, there's a little bit of a competing scenario there. If you're interested in all this, listen to last month's recording. The short version is GitHub is where everything is going. That's where Microsoft makes the biggest investments in terms of adding to it. But Azure DevOps is here to stay. So if you're on Azure DevOps like we are, uh, in my organization. We are happily using Azure DevOps and that'll be here for a very long time. Uh, it has a great feature set and it's continuous uh, development on it. Uh, just because Microsoft themselves are very dependent on it. Most of Microsoft's own code is in Azure DevOps. Um, but if you're starting anew with this, GitHub is where it's eventually all moving. So you might as well go with that. So anyway, check out last month's recordings uh, available for free on stateof.net.com. Now here is a service I really wanted to mention uh, in today's presentation, and that is Azure Communication Services. I haven't really used that very much myself yet. It's something that we just discovered and it's just starting to play with. But what this is, it allows you to do all kinds of communication. So what we're talking about is, is uh, not voice, should say voice and video chat. Uh, so if you need to do, you need to integrate video chat in your application, this is the service you want to use. If you need to send SMS text messages out of your application, this is the service you, you should use. Uh, if you need to integrate with Microsoft Teams, which is a rapidly growing platform in itself, and you can extend it and develop for it, this is a great technology and a great platform to use. And in fact, most of what's in Azure Communication Services comes from the Teams team. So the stuff that they needed to make Microsoft Teams and make all these things work is available to you as a service. So very, very cool thing. Uh, we just started playing with this ourselves. Can't wait to do more with it. I highly recommend checking it out. Now a whole other area of stuff uh, that we have is the cognitive services side of things. Uh, cognitive services is essentially what we call AI, what we call machine learning. All of that Microsoft groups under this uh, cognitive services bucket. And there's more stuff in that than we could discuss in a single stata.net just right here. And in fact, we had a stata.net about cognitive services a few months ago. So if you're interested in this, go back, check out the recording. But the key point here is this makes it very easy for you to do things out of the machine learning domain. Now you're gonna say, well, what apps can benefit from machine learning? The question should be what apps can't benefit from machine learning because there's almost every app, especially business applications can benefit from these, from more intelligent behavior of your app, whether that has to do with image recognition, whether it has to do with speech recognition, whether it has to do with search, advanced searches in business applications that understand what you're searching for by simply putting a term into a single text field like you would say uh, on the Google site and then getting back a meaningful result that really gives you the most likely results that match that search, let's say a database search or a, for, for products or a customer search, um, returning something that's more meaningful than just a text string comparison is super important for business applications. So, so these are some simple examples of what you can do with this. 
uh, but there are many, many more out there. So go back, check out those recordings, uh, take a look at some of the articles we've been publishing for this. Uh, there's a lot of really interesting stuff there. Another thing I want to take a look at is digital twins. This is a concept that over the last six or more, six to 12 months, has really gained a lot of momentum. What's a digital twin? A digital twin is a, a representation of a real-world object in the digital domain. You could think of this simply as a person, for instance, a user, representing a user that, that really exists in the real world uh, in the digital domain and then assigning rights and letting that user do things and tracking how that user moves through the system. Um, but you could use this for other things. You could think of machines uh, as a digital twin. You could think of places in the world as digital twins. You could think of processes that run. So a machine, for instance, could be an IoT device and you want to have this IoT device registered in your database with certain attributes or a machine that's running in a, in a manufacturing process uh, and, and you want to track that through the system, you can do that with Azure Digital Twin. So it's a, you know, th think of it as a specialized database that can model these things very well and can also represent the relationships between these entities. What person uses what machine, what IoT device gives us data that's important for something else. So it's important for tracking and modeling of these entities. It's also important for running simulations ahead of time. So you can take these digital twins and say, well, what happens if this uh, thing does that? Uh, maybe uh, you could track, for instance, Microsoft uses this themselves uh, to track servers as digital twins and they can simulate what would happen if this piece of hardware goes down? What are the, the relationships and what would be the fallout? So very, very interesting technology and an interesting way of uh, looking. It's not totally new, right? But it's an interesting twist on how you can think of these things. And that's available to you as a service now with visualization and tracking tools and all that. Um, getting towards the end here of things I want to mention also to the end of my time slot, I believe. Um, this is an interesting thing, ARM. When we say ARM, a lot of people think of ARM processors and ARM hardware. This, that's something different. ARM stands for Azure, Azure Resource Manager. Uh, ARM is a way to manage all the resources you have in Azure. So when I just showed you this first example of creating a website, uh, an, an app service, that was a resource I created and I did so manually through the portal I went to. Now there's other ways of doing this. There's a command line interface where I could have just run some command line thing and it would have done exactly the same thing without me ever opening the portal. And I could have done that on my machine or I could have done that through a command line interface in the browser if I wanted to. Uh, but that's all manual. But what if I have thousands of servers to set up in, in 50 different regions around the world? Well, in that case, I want to automate that somehow. Right? And I want to automate the rights and what can deploy to these things and what other, you know, the fact that this website also needs a microservice container architecture and that needs to be created and so on and so on. ARM is a way to automate that. Yeah, and, and so that's very, very widely used. And the way you usually deal with the Azure Resource Manager is you create these files, these JSON-based files uh, that are a little bit convoluted that that make for these scripts or as they're called templates. Uh, so you'll hear the term ARM template mentioned. So that's very, very useful. The scripts are a little bit of a pain to create. So therefore, Microsoft has now created something new called BICEP. BICEP is a new language, a domain specific language, a uh, pretty simple language in that, so not very difficult to learn. That is a much more natural syntax for creating these ARM templates. And especially when you have larger things that have cross dependencies. So how do you actually script that you're creating a web app and a few containers that you need to access at this location and then you're creating a second web app and it needs to have also this set of containers, but they're now at a different location. How do you actually script the web app creation to point at the right things, the right dependencies? And, and so that's one example of something that BICEP is very good at. And you can create these BICEP scripts just about anywhere. A very good way is to do that through VS Code because there's specific templates and integration in VS Code. So you get fantastic IntelliSense, for instance. So as you're referencing resources that are already there, for instance, 
the IntelliSense knows and it's it has machine learning built in so it knows what you're most likely to do. And it's, it's actually a very, very cool system. And so you can create these bicep scripts. Uh, and by the way, Anders Heilsberg, the creator of C Sharp has been behind this as well. And so you create these scripts and you can either compile them to the JSON setup. Uh, you can even cross compile the older JSON templates into these bicep scripts. Uh, or you can now, uh, I believe, maybe in preview or, or has been just released, I'm not totally sure, but you can take these bicep scripts and just stick them into the Azure Resource Manager and it actually natively understands them. So a cool thing to automate uh, your management and deployment of Azure resources. Uh, and finally, the last thing I want to mention just uh, as another example is Azure API management. Uh, of course, when we build cloud native apps, especially, we build a lot of services. We build microservices, we build uh, APIs. We need to manage the APIs. We need to create security around these APIs and compliance. We may have to set things like usage limits, policies. We need to deal with discoverability of these things. Uh, and Azure API management is a service that helps you with that. So, so we kind of come in full circle back to developing uh, relatively low level things again and making it easy. So these are some services that I picked out as examples, but the list goes on and on. And people may be sitting at home screaming at their YouTube uh, stream right now saying, why didn't he mention this other thing? It's really important and that's absolutely true. But as you see, I'm already over my time. Uh, there's really only so much I can do. What we will do in the future is we'll probably investigate a lot of these things as Code Presents webinars that we can really drill into specific features like that. Uh, we'll, of course, continue publishing these things in Code Magazine. There's a lot to talk about just with these Azure services. Um, and they're easy to explore for the most part. You'll, you'll be amazed how approachable, simple things um, such as, for instance, machine learning, how approachable that becomes through these services. There's a question about the bicep scripts. Uh, there's a uh, question is, can you export bicep script? And I'm assuming what that means is compiling it back into the native representation that the ARM templates were. And the answer is yes, there's a, basically a compilation process that you can do. Uh, there's also a decompilation process going the other way. And so that's useful. Uh, and you could use that for all kinds of other things. But now uh, the, the Azure Resource Manager is now also starting to understand these bicep scripts much more natively. And so you don't necessarily have to do that, but yet you can. All right, well, that concludes the main part of this presentation. If you have any questions about this, if you are sitting there thinking, how does this apply to me? or I was here because I was hoping he would tell me about this one specific service and he didn't. Feel free to email us. I always tell people we are not the kind of company that will send you a bill for, for a quick email answer. Uh, as I said it in the intro, feel free to send it to me. My contact info is at the, in this slide deck, which you can download from stateof.net.com. Um, but I recommend that you probably contact either Jim or Ian instead because they'll get you a much quicker answer. I freely admit, ever since we've started taking these Stata.net events online, we've gotten a lot of these requests. So uh, my guys helping out uh, are, are much more quickly able to respond. But, but do consider that an option. I do promise we'll get back to you. I want to remind you one more time about the survey we got going. It helps us tremendously if you give us feedback and tell us what kinds of topics you would like to hear for Stata.net, for the Code Presents, webinar seminars uh, that we've started for Code Magazine topics. So please do us a favor, give us some feedback. You can even win an Amazon gift certificate uh, if you do it before uh, Friday, I think this is. Um, but you can, I think, take the survey later as well. So, so you, would, you would do us a favor by doing this. Uh, the free hour of consulting that Jim managed, uh, mentioned in the intro, this is something we offer to everyone that came to these seminars. If you sit there, like I said, thinking about how does this apply to me or you even have a completely different issue, sign up for a free hour. We'll no strings attached. You don't need to give us a credit card or anything like that. We'll just do a, an hour of consulting with you. And if it's an hour and a half, fine. It'll be an hour and a half, right? It, it's just 
feel free to contact us for this consulting offering. It is, however, first come, first serve. Uh, we've, uh, this has been a, a popular initiative, gone a little bit beyond of what we can handle. So contact us sooner rather than later because you, this, you might be scheduled in relatively late if you don't. Uh, and, you know, if, if we get totally overloaded, no promises. I uh, also want to draw your attention to the Cobe mobile app. Uh, we do have a mobile application that was redone about a year ago, the early days of the COVID crisis. Uh, it's a cool way to read Cobe magazine on iOS and Android. And we promised when we first did this, we'll keep all our content for free uh, in this app, as long as you have any kind of subscription. And if you came to this event, you have a free subscription because we'll automatically assign you one unless you don't want one. Uh, and we even have um, free links for a free subscription. So bottom line, we need to track you somehow to know what you're reading. Uh, that's part of our infrastructure so we can serve you up the, the magazine. That's necessary. But beyond that, the content is just completely free of charge at this point. You can read all code magazines we, always, we, we ever have. So check that out. Pass it on to your friends. I think it's a very cool initiative. Also, Code Magazine is free as a Microsoft benefit. If you are any kind of Microsoft customer, uh, if you have a VSS subscription, a Dev Essential subscription, what, what used to be called an MSDN subscription, basically, uh, you can go into the portal and you can activate your free subscription benefit. Tell your friends about this. They probably uh, don't know about this either. Uh, so that's been a, a pretty large partnership we've had with Microsoft now for, I think, a year and a half. And people are taking advantage of this quite a bit. Finally, mark your calendars for the next event. Uh, the next data.net topic really goes back to the roots. We are taking a look at .NET itself, which is, I guess, what a data.net topic should be. Uh, but as you see, we go off into all these other directions that are things that are important for .NET developers. But this next one is really about .NET itself. Where are we at with .NET 5? What's coming with .NET 6? What are the tools around it? What are the key technologies, the key goals that go into .NET 6 and have gone into .NET 5? What's going on with the full .NET framework? Is that dead or not? Spoiler, it's not. It's still going to be around for a long time. But anyway, that's going to be the, the next topic, a very fundamental back to the roots, uh, dear to my heart type of topic. So I'm looking forward to that. As always, last uh, Wednesday in the month, that'll be the 26th of May. You can already sign up for this today and feel free to pass this on to your friends. We are always happy when uh, people put that on social media and help us uh, get the word out. Uh, and with that, I want to say thank you very much for attending. Here is some more information about how you can contact us. Uh, like I said, feel free to contact us. I'll stick around a little bit longer here to see if there's any questions coming up. And other than that, thank you very much for attending and hope to see you next time. Thank you.